We're going to take a wander out to our neighbor's yard this morning and take a look at plants, do some watering in the nursery area, maybe in the high tunnel. And I thought it'd be an opportunity to share some notes around specifically the filter of taking a lawn or taking an early successional space and moving it up into a more resilient, long-lived perennial food-bearing system, a food forest, a little bit like how this space is developing. And so I want to talk about that through that lens and just give a little general update as well. So I'm going to wander out there. This space where we've been growing has been being developed since 2013, so it's well on its way towards some levels of maturity. We still have some openings here or there that we work with, but overall it's on track to become a pretty stable food forest. And I'd like to see the same happen for that space out here. If you remember from some of the earlier videos, it was April of 2020 that this was a mowed lawn. And here we are in 2022 in later June. Uh, so it moved pretty quickly. Pretty much everything from here onward, including the pond, which we can take a look at, this high tunnel, that's all been since the beginning of the fun times of 2020. And it's pretty amazing how fast things move. And just like our garden, my hope for this space was to have it move relatively quickly into a more perennial, uh, stable, resilient system. So it needs a little bit less work. It can handle the more extreme weather swings we seem to be experiencing. Last year was very, very wet and cool. This year so far is pretty darn hot and dry. And the more we can use perennials and woody perennials in particular in these systems, the more they can tend to survive these unknown futures. But we don't just want to have perennials because there are things we'd like to be eating now. So what does it look like to integrate annuals into a young food forest system? And how can we, how can we manage that? How can we think it through? I think there's ways to look at it where you don't get bogged down with complexity of design. In fact, I'll just take a look at this one area here. This is a roughly 10 foot diameter circle. What was here when we first started working was a thicket of um, honeysuckle, Japanese honeysuckle. There were some ash trees in here which remain. We're getting hammered by emerald ash borer. I think these will probably pass away, but that's not my call to make. We'll give them a chance. Um, but we, so we thinned out the honeysuckle. We just basically chop and drop the honeysuckle, put a bunch of compost on top. Um, and the first year since we made this little clearing, we simply sowed a bunch of radishes in there. So we leveraged fast, fast growing annual crops. And what we also did is not interfere with them. We let them overwinter as they wanted. And so now there is a little bit of a stable um, biennial element in here of these radishes and their flowering state will again not interrupt too much. We'll let them drop more seed. They're creating good cover. They're penetrating down into the earth and softening the soil and they're giving a crop for us as needed but also browse for the bees. So annuals as the first step in a perennial system often make a lot, a lot of sense. Two years ago, or maybe last year, we added in what will ultimately be the keystone element in the future here, which is this young persimmon tree. The persimmon is being supported by an autumn olive and there's a gumi on the other side. And so those will generate a bunch of nitrogen for this system. They're near the edge of the boundary or uh, edge of the walkway so they can be cut as needed and used as a mulch to support the persimmon. But I will tell you for the most part, persimmon, this one in particular is very happy. It probably doesn't need the nitrogen fixing element, uh, but there'll be other plants in the scene that will. So we have the ash overstory that was here. In other words, there was not a necessary clear cut in order to make this happen. Just enough light opening that a tree could be added in, some nitrogen fixing support, but then also these annuals as a really fast way to cover the ground. Ultimately, we'd like to see some perennials in here. Maybe it's an herbaceous perennial layer. Maybe it's honey berries or maybe um, <clears throat> currants or something like that. But we can plant those into the, de the dead material of these radishes in the fall. And the edge ultimately would want to be 
a rhizome barrier of some sort in the perennial form. Maybe it's sorrel or something, rhubarb. But for now, we're very happy to have squash and sunflower and amaranth. So again, fast growing annuals that can give us a lovely yield. There's some chard in there. There's more amaranth, more sunflowers. And so these are doing the work of being the edge for now in annual form and giving us flexibility to change over later. Whew. That's a lot to say about a random circle in the yard. This spot to the north of the high tunnel is actually a very, very early, early succession arc. And the way this has been set up is very straightforward. This uh, spring, we spread out round bales of hay incredibly deeply. And that's sometimes all it takes to kill almost every plant that's growing. Uh, yellow dock in particular seems able to pop through, but now we can pull them and just use them as a mulch. This is entirely annual right now. We do know we want to move this perennial, but not quite sure how just yet. And so we have very fast growing and spreading zucchini. That's giving us good ground cover and uh, moisture retention as we come into the heat. We have sorghum planted to the north of those, hoping to get more carbon and more root penetration. Looks like grasses, but they're actually sorghum. And then there's amaranth that showed up in the compost. This is from our chicken compost. There's tomatoes and amaranth, and we'll invite them in for the season as well. And we can give some time to figure out what happens next in here. And it could just be that we put in cuttings in the fall uh, after these crops are winding down. That would work just fine. Maybe currants again, honeyberry, going pretty hard on those because they work really well here. And it gives another growing season for us to get input from the more established systems of what works in this climate, in this soil. So those are some earlier systems, relatively young, super, super young, just beginning. And this is a system that's getting a little bit more established and deepening. This was uh, a link here to a video where Juan and I planted this out. This was in the spring of 2020. And these were all just cuttings of elderberry, willow, and currants, very thoroughly established now. And so we're thinking about what the next layer of succession in this space is. Let's dive in. The idea with this planting of the currants, the elders, and the willow was to have the lawn taken over as fast as possible. And built into the design, built into the intent of this, was to have all of the biomass we need for mulch right where we are, and that we would do a whole lot of thinning and generate the green manure, the soil covering, and the protection, and then the periodic light openings for the next layer of succession later on. Let me get a little deeper into that if that doesn't make any sense. Part of the challenge of developing new gardens and landscapes is the establishment period. So if we were, for example, to put these elderberries and willows on 10-foot spacings between each other, year one was a very dry year. Every single one of them would have needed more watering because they were exposed to uh, more sun on all sides, more drying forces. More competition from weeds means more mowing and weed whacking and pulling and mulching. Whereas with these contiguous blocks, you can see now they're closed canopy enough that it is pretty dark shady underneath here. I mowed a month ago in here. I think that might be the last time we need to mow in this area once these crowns touch. Um, and so it does the work of moving up in succession very quickly when you plant close. And especially woody perennials that propagate easily from cuttings. This entire area took about an hour to plant and cost zero dollars. Uh, this is pretty remarkable how well that works. But now we're adding in some other elements and we need to think through what that successional arc can look like. So for example, as I walk to the north here of this block of black currants and Bob Gordon elderberry. Absolutely beautiful, really lovely uh, canopy closure. We did a few times this year, but not much. And now that's done. No watering needed, uh, no fertilizing needed because it self fertilizes with all the leaf drop in the fall. But I don't know that I want just two characters in this area. I like the idea of a bit more diversity uh, and also to see what happens next in an ecosystem like this, which is the tree layer. That tends to be the natural next move with these. And so here on the northern end 
is the next layer of succession. This is an American persimmon. We've found over the years these tend to be extremely tolerant of dry or wet, shade or sun. And so it felt like a nice fit in here. We put these this friend to the northern end of this so that over time it still holds the option of tons and tons of light down through this system to the south. And what we'll begin doing is as soon as the elderberry <clears throat> harvest is done, we can either start chopping these elders to provide some mulch to the persimmon, or we can wait until the fall and take cuttings from these elderberries to either sell or propagate elsewhere. But we can start reducing this part of the food forest to promote the next layer in this area. Here's an example where that will need to happen sooner rather than later. This is another American persimmon and at this point, I'd say they're under a fair bit of stress. They're still growing upright, so they're okay, but soon we will need to really cut this elder. We're coming into a dry, hot time, so we're gonna leave them for now, but this will be our source of mulch and fertility to stoke the flames of growth for this persimmon. Once they pop up above, they'll do their own competition of the elders below them, so we don't have to manage or support them after that. Um, but tucking in these tree elements into these young shrub systems works just phenomenally well, but definitely requires some intervention. Now, willow in particular is just such a great candidate for uh, checking the boxes of very inexpensive, very easy to get established and growing, uh, really adaptable to a lot of different sites, in particular very high moisture sites, and an ability to translate moisture and soil fertility into really bioavailable green manure. So there's explicitly in here some real biomass willows. These leaves laid in thick piles will be very nourishing for soil life. <clears throat> and intentionally here, the next layer of succession is a hungry, slow-growing tree. These are northern pecans. There's one here, there's one there. We planted them in association with an autumn olive so that they had their own nitrogen fixation character right with them. But one or two of them died. I think the autumn olives were not getting nearly enough light. So these pecans are growing, but pretty slowly. And <clears throat> what I'm waiting for now is a good deep rain so that the ground around them is nice and nourished and moist. And then we can retain that moisture and start breaking down the fertility of all this green that's growing around the pecan by selectively going through these willows. First pass will probably be lopper work to bring up the sides of them so we don't lose this pathway. You can see there's so much biomass just in the spirit of pruning up to get this walkway open so that once in a while we can use an electric mower to harvest green manure and keep our access. This will generate enough mulch to easily support what these pecans need in order to get up and running. We can take a second pass later in the season if need be, or maybe wait till next year and think about cutting them back up high so that more late day light gets into these pecans. But it makes it so malleable. We can say we want more light, less light. We want more manure. We don't need as much. Uh, when I say manure, of course, I'm meaning green manure from the plants. It just works out pretty nicely to add in as much density, as much complexity and diversity as possible, and then add in your later succession elements and chop and drop the first layer to feed the second. As we come to the southern end of this, there are some more patterns playing out. Here we've got ranch elderberry providing a really beautiful flow of nectar for bees. We can harvest the flowers as needed. There'll be fruit in a bit that we can harvest or not. That could be for the birds. Uh, they don't need any sort of pruning from the willows to the west of them. They're getting all the light they need. We're looking for that lean and for that light stress before we start thinking about chopping. And since we're not seeing that, we're not worrying about it. And last year, we gardened this bed in annuals. This was tromboncino squash um, and tomatoes and chard down this whole line. And so now, this spring, we've added in the berry layer. So we started with annuals in the initial disturbance. Now we're in early succession uh, cane layer. There are honey berries, there's currants, there's some cultivar elderberry, uh, there's a gumi or two. So small to mid-sized shrubs that will work well in this space. They're getting established, we'll water them, we'll harvest grass with the mower, we'll harvest 
leaves from the willows and keep feeding them to that establishment layer. And now this year we've put more hay down, more weed suppression, dumped compost and added annuals again. So more squash. So it's the same pattern happening over and over again. I hope that the sentiment that's being conveyed is that this isn't that complex and it isn't that very specific. Um, it really is about trying to find those plants that grow very well where you live. And that's a trial and error thing. It's also lots of communication with neighbors and family members to learn that. And thinking about the, the truth of succession, that things move up from early succession or a suppressed succession, that is a lawn, generally with fast growing annuals and biennials, small shrubs, and that sort of form, herbaceous perennials and herbaceous per, uh, biennials that are a little bit larger, moving up into shrub and small tree form into tree form. That's the successional arc. Wherever you are, that generally is how things play out. And you might find some real value in looking at a website called Plants for a Future, pfaf.org, to think through some of the plants that might fit the criteria, the size, the zone hardiness, the amount of precipitation you get, etc. So you can play out those experiments uh, that are relevant to where you live. And I think a lot of where this boils down to as well is a strong encouragement, as I think I do fairly often in these videos, to think about integrating small scale nursery work into your garden so uh, you can afford to take cuttings and divisions and set up a little seedling bed of peaches or have gumi seed that you collect from fruit from a neighbor's spot and start it in a little nursery bed so you can afford to plant out 20 of them instead of one or two that cost $29 a piece. The more you can propagate your own plant material, the more you can trade with other folks that have more established contexts. So maybe there are some more uh, wild spaces or established uh, forest farms where you are Maybe it's not the perfect thing you're looking for, but somebody has a bunch of hazelnuts you can collect, or someone has a wild stand of elderberry in the ditch you can take cuttings from. All of those things liberate you to experiment and uh, approach the levels of density and complexity that facilitate resilience and an ability to step away from management pretty quickly, uh, and then have tons of material to harvest and manage later on as needed. Let's continue dialogue in the comments below. Please share some pathways that you found to be really facultative and supportive in taking landscapes that have been in lawn or degraded field or sprayed annual crop production and moving them up into more resilient productive systems. What did that arc look like? What are the cast of characters? What sort of strategies did you use? We'll keep sharing notes. There are a lot of pathways out of a lawn or out of a uh, chemical cornfield and this is just one of those and it's starting to really settle into its own. You know when the plantings you set in motion are much taller than you, things are going in a good direction. You can always make them shorter than you again with pruners and they'll just get taller again. And eventually you disappear, but the system actually persists and that's what really matters. We'll be sharing notes pretty soon on our air prune propagation system. This was a lawn uh, two months ago, three months ago. We'll be sharing notes on erasing lawn contacts simply with just wood chips and then thinking about planting into them over time. And as we keep chipping away at more and more of this, we'll share what sort of experiments we use. Um, certainly potatoes have helped a lot. Deep, deep wood chips, adding cuttings and mulching, round bales of hay, leaf bags in the fall. Most of these things being either free or low enough cost uh, to be worth considering and all of them generating way more fertility and actual value in all the different ways you can assess value in a landscape. So hope that was helpful, kind of long-winded. Uh, let me know if you've got questions or concerns and suggestions and things like that, and we'll talk again soon. Take care.